Okay, let's start our final unit of the semester, um, which is a lecture on forensic dentistry or odontology, um, as it's also known as. Um, so this power, PowerPoint was actually um, one that I used when I gave a presentation on forensic dentistry um, to the Iowa Association of Dental Assistants, I think it was. So um, there's some slides in here that you know you already know the material, so I'll probably go by those pretty quickly. Um, but I do also wanna caution you that um, there's some gnarly picks in here. Um, but I want to make sure that you know you see them, so you kind of understand um, what samples um, or what kind of specimens forensic dentists are dealing with, um, and what they can do with those. Okay, so blah blah blah. That was for the dental assisting. We know what probative means already. Okay, we've already gone through this. So, okay, here is where we're going to start the material. So first of all. Forensic dentistry and forensic odontology mean the exact same thing. Um, here in the United States, um, North America, you know, Canada, US, we tend to call it odontology, whereas um, over in Europe, they refer to it as forensic dentistry, but um, it means the exact same thing. So by far, I would say probably at least about 90% of the time, um, the main job of a forensic odontologist is to figure out who this person is okay so I'm sure you've heard of um, you know people who've had to be been identified using their dental records you know whether they were in a fire or they were in a really bad car accident or you know um, in an advanced stage of decomposition so yeah that's the primary duty of an odontologist and what they do most of the time however they can do a bunch of other things too and they can actually um, assist in civil cases um, not just criminal cases and you know purely identification cases so of course they can help work you know violent crimes whether it's homicides assaults sexual assaults um, one of the other things that forensic dentists do is they can um, uh, analyze bite marks. And so we'll talk about those. And um, surprisingly, bite marks are seen in an incredibly large percentage of sexual assault cases. Um, so whatever, for whatever reason, during those assaults, um, the, the offenders um, often will bite their victims. If they're female victims, a lot of times those bite marks are found around the breast area, but you know they can be found anywhere. Um, surprisingly too, and this was shocking to me, is how often people use their teeth as weapons. So we actually see bite marks um, in cases of child abuse and elder abuse too, which, you know, that was just, that was news to me. I had no idea. Um, of course, when we're talking about a missing person, maybe someone who when the, a body is discovered, it's skeletonized. Um, they can use to uh, be used to help identify that person. Mass disaster scenarios where people are fragmented and they have very severe trauma. Um, then also looking at bite marks not on people, but also potentially left at a scene. So, um, you know, if someone leaves a wad of gum or they made themselves at home and ate something at the scene, um, those types of bite marks can be looked at too. Um, and that's where the tie-in to DNA comes in. So actually odontology and DNA um, work really well together and I'll give you some case examples on those. Um, the civil cases that I'm talking about stem from professional negligence. Okay, so we'd like to think that every person who graduates from dental school is gonna be an awesome practitioner, you know, a really good dentist. Um, unfortunately, in any profession, you have people that, you know, either simply are just not very good at it, or maybe they're lazy, or maybe there's more of a financial motive. Um, so a forensic dentist is also trained to look at um, cases of inadequate dental care and determine if um, you know a practitioner was negligent in treating patients. So here's a historical figure that I'm sure you heard of, Paul Revere. So we think of him, you know, as you know, one if by land, two if by sea, you know, in the Revolutionary War. Well, he actually was technically the United States' first forensic odontologist um, because his career was he made things out of silver, but 
Um, he also made dentures for people. Now, um, contra uh, contradictory to what you might hear of history, I know I always thought that George Washington had dentures made of wood. Um, actually, that was not what dentures were made of during this time period. They were made of metal and porcelain. Um, so here are some, you know, dentures from that time period, which, oh my God, I bet they were incredibly uncomfortable to wear, but you know, if you need your teeth to chew, you're going to do what you have to do. So um, Paul Revere would put his markings on these dentures that he would make and he would put the patient's name on there. So in the Revolutionary War, um, there was a person who was killed by British troops, Dr. Joseph Warren. Um, he was put in a grave and obviously was very decomposed when his body was discovered. And so it was Paul Revere who went in and said, yo, I made those dentures and I made them for Joseph Warren. Um, and that allowed them to um, uh, identify his remains. I actually am gonna tell you about a case where you can't always assume that the dentures in the person belong to that person. Um, but I'm sure back in the day, you know, people didn't really trade dentures and probably you had to have some kind of wealth to be able to for afford dentures to be made for you in the first place. Okay, so once again, for an exam, um, yeah, I want you to know who Paul Revere is, that he was the first case of forensic dentistry being used in the US. Do you have to memorize Joseph Warren or this date? Absolutely not. So, why is odontology such a useful discipline? Okay, and once again, like I told you in anthropology, because I'm not trained as an anthropologist, like I assume that, oh, you've gotta have an intact skeleton to be able to make these you know, determinations, where, as we learned, you know, like to estimate someone's height, you only need one long bone, like someone's femur or their humerus. The same thing goes for forensic odontology. So they don't need a skull with a full set of teeth, okay? First of all, the person may not have had a full set of teeth you know, while they were alive, so they're not gonna have that when they're deceased, but also um, teeth are incredibly individual. Not only do they have individual shapes as they form, but then also, you know, people grind their teeth. Um, you know, they have different levels of dental care. Um, they have cavities and, you know, different types of things that happen to their teeth over a lifetime. Excuse me. So they're totally unique to that person. So because an odontologist is primarily a dentist, they're going to know about, you know, reading um, charting. Like when you go to the dentist for your cleaning, you know, I always hear my dentist say things like, okay, we've got an occlusion on 32, you know, when they're talking about the different tooth numbers and different shapes. Um, they can certainly, uh, they're very familiar with all of that. Um, but looking at the shapes of teeth, the appearances, um, meaning, you know, are there cavities, even if it's just a fragment of a tooth or a fragment of the skull or the jawbone, an odontologist can a lot of times make an identification from just a small, single fragment. And of course, dentists are also really, really knowledgeable about, um, you know, the bones of the skull and the bones of the jaw because it's not like they just treat teeth, right? They're looking at someone's entire mouth. And so they're very um, well-trained with all of that um, structure and anatomy as well. Restorations refer to, you know, people getting fillings and crowns and implants and anything that's basically, you know, done by your dentist when you have a cavity or, or some type of problem. Okay, so all of these, whether it's a single tooth, whether it's a, you know, a crown or a root canal, a fragment of the jaw, all of these may possess features that can potentially be associated with just one person. So you don't need to have an entire mouthful of teeth to make an identification. The other thing, and I mentioned this because remember I was a DNA person, dental evidence is also a really good source of DNA. So um, teeth are very resistant. They don't decompose. Um, even, you know, they may fall out of the jaw as the, the tissue around them decomposes, but the teeth themselves are not going to decompose because they're made of calcium and, um, you know, they're a really hard structure. And within your teeth, um, you have a really good blood supply and nerve supply. And anytime you have blood cells and nerve cells, 
that's gonna be a really plentiful source of DNA. So it's very possible, and in fact, I've worked a case like this where you have a single tooth, when you open that tooth up, you take out what is called the pulp chamber, and that is full of um, you know, potential DNA. Um, also, with bite marks, um, anytime someone leaves a bite mark, they're also gonna leave a bunch of their saliva, and saliva contains plenty of epithelial cells, which will have the DNA profile of that person. So um, odontology and DNA actually you know, work really well together. So uh, once again, if you watch TV, right, you know, there's always a forensic odontologist hanging around to help solve cases. Um, the reality is there are no full-time forensic odontologist in the United States unless they're working for the military and federal government forensic units like the lab, the anthropology lab over in Hawaii that we talked about. Okay, so forensic odontologists that work in the United States are usually dentists, okay, whether they are, you know, have a family practice or maybe they're a pediatric dentist Maybe they are an endodontist, which is a per person who does just root canals, or an orthodontist, you know, if you've ever had braces. Um, and then what they do is they um, seek training above and beyond that. And then, of course, they can consult on cases. Um, you know, and we don't have people, especially in Iowa, that would require a full-time odontologist because, you know, we're, we're not finding people burn beyond recognition every single day um, in Iowa. Um, thankfully. So yeah, normally they are working their day jobs as a regular dentist and then they seek training. Now, a person can also call themselves a forensic dentist but not be officially board certified. Okay, so if someone really wants to pursue a career and be known as the forensic odontologist for their community, um, they have to, you know, do casework through the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology. They have to go spend a couple weeks at a time. Um, and there are pathology institutes, I believe in Dallas, Texas, and then also in Washington, DC. But you know what, they're not reimbursed for that. It's probably on their own dime and it's because they just wanna get that training. Um, they may look at being as a forensic odontologist as a way of you know, community service or kind of their ethical duty. Um, so, you know, God love them, thanks for that. But actually, if you were to look in the United States and Canada, there are actually only 84 board certified forensic odontologists, which means that they can put the letters ABFO after their name. Um, so yeah, they have to go through training and they have to go through um, sample forensic casework that is reviewed and then they have to take a big exam. So, you know, it's kind of a big deal, okay? So you can be a forensic dentist without being a board certified forensic odontologist. And the, the board certified guys are normally where the big high profile cases go to. So here's some example of case types that we see in odontology. Um, first and foremost, you know, trying to identify people. And remember, these can be criminal cases, um, it can be natural disasters, like before I had mentioned Hurricane Katrina, the Asian tsunami, you know, um, the World Trade Center attacks, airline crashes, bombings. Um, even if you find, for example, a body that maybe is not in the missing persons database, maybe it's a homeless person, um, you know, who died a while ago out in the environment, maybe of natural causes, you can still um, use forensic dentistry because obviously you want to try your best to identify that person. So the reason that they're useful is First of all, we talked about fingerprints and how fingerprints are great if you have them, first of all, and you may not have that with skeletonized or really decomposed remains. Um, and also, you may not have any fingerprints to compare to if that person hasn't worked in law enforcement or hasn't been in trouble you know, with law enforcement, so their fingerprints are in a database or in the military. So yeah, fingerprints are awesome. They're always the best way of, to identify someone, but um, the application is limited, okay? It can also, let's say it's a person who's not decomposed, but maybe they're found and they have nothing on them. 
that suggests who they are. So there's no driver's license. There's no ID card. There may not be any jewelry. You know, uh, oftentimes these are homeless people and we don't know who they are. So odontologists could help with that. They also can do something, which we'll get to a little later in the lecture, um, called dental profiling, where it's not so much about specific identification, but it's let's look at this person's teeth and see if that can tell us a little bit maybe about their ethnicity, maybe about their lifestyle, their socioeconomic level, and use those to try to build a picture of who this person is. Okay, so yeah, anytime someone's decomposed, burned beyond recognition, suffering a lot of trauma, so they are fragmented. Now, the other thing with using forensic dentistry is you have to have dental records to compare to. Okay, so the postmortem dental records, those are pretty easy because that body is going to be x-rayed at the, you know, the medical examiner's office or the hospital, wherever it ends up. However, did that person go to the dentist during their lifetime? And unfortunately, in this country, a lot of times people have to choose between, okay, I can pay my rent and put food on the table for my family, or I can take them to the dentist. It's almost seen as more of a luxury, which is really, really sad because it's not, you know, dental care is really important to your health in general. But if you have a person who's a drug addict and is homeless, I don't think checking in for their six month cleaning is gonna be high on their priority list. So you may have teeth post-mortem, but you don't have any when they were alive, which is what anti-mortem means, records to compare to. The other thing is that you can't compare adult teeth to baby teeth, okay? So remember, we have, you know, we're born and we get our teeth when we're little kids, but then as we become adults, those teeth fall out um, and then our adult teeth come in and it's literally looking at apples and oranges. So if you have an adult person that's found, but the last time they went to the dentist was when they were eight years old, you can't compare those two types of records. Okay, so here's an example of a person burned beyond recognition. Um, you know, we talked about how they're in the pugilistic attitude position. Um, Teeth, you know, if the fire burns hot enough, can teeth potentially crack and maybe the enamel melt? Um, yes, but it would have to be a super, super hot fire, something like a plane crash where you've got fragmentation and then it's jet fuel burning. Um, that can result in teeth actually looking um, more like glass. Um, you know, odontologists refer to it as the teeth becoming mineralized. So this was actually a, a flash fire. So this person's teeth were fully intact. And luckily this person had been to the dentist within um, I think a few years. And so they were able to do an identification from those records. Okay, here's an example of someone with a filling. And you know, like I mentioned, you don't have to look at every single tooth. So here we have the anti-mortem dental x-ray. That's meaning when the person was alive, okay? And this is the filling right here. Here's the dental x-ray that was taken post-mortem. And really, it's kind of like doing pattern evidence because what they'll do is take this image and then just try to superimpose it. And you can see that these two are gonna be overlaying each other, just kind of like a puzzle piece that fits. So that single image and that single filling would be enough to identify that person, okay? So it doesn't have to be multiple teeth. It can be one filling in one tooth. And remember, all of your fillings are going to be completely unique. Um, you know, no one's teeth, first of all, are the same. Then you're gonna get decay in, you know, no one's decay. Your cavity is gonna be different from anyone else's cavities. And so your restorations are gonna look different too. They're very individualizing. Okay, here's another example. This is um, what is called a bridge. And a bridge, so let's say you have a really bad tooth. It gets abscessed or whatever, and the dentist is like, you know what, we can't save that tooth. We need to, to take it out. So um, if you had a bunch of money, 
you could get dental, you know, actual implants where they would take a fake tooth and then put it with screws into your jawbone. Obviously, you know, it's kind of an intensive procedure and it costs a lot. Um, and dental insurance, even when you have really good dental insurance, it's not, you know, it doesn't cover that much. So a lot of people opt for what is called a bridge and you basically have a fake tooth, okay, that's not going into the bone. And then you put crowns on either side, the adjacent teeth, okay? So if someone were to look at your teeth, they would never know that you were missing a tooth because you have this fake porcelain tooth in there. But a bridge is much less expensive than doing actual dental implants, okay? And it protects the area, so, you know, why not? So here's another example of someone who had a bridge. These were the x-rays taken when they were alive compared to the post-mortem x-rays. You do an overlay, and you can see that the image is gonna fit pretty much perfectly. I know the angles are kind of weird here, but when they overlay them, it was an exact fit. And so that one bridge is enough to definitively identify someone. Yikes. Okay, we're gonna start with that gross picture um, in our next, next lecture because we're at the 21 minute mark and I wanna get this uploading. Okay, thank you.